Hi friends, most of you watch my channel without subscribing. Please subscribe if you like my stories. Have a good rest. My wife and I have been together for 29 years, married for 26 of those. I'm a 51-year-old man, she's a 49-year-old woman, and we have two grown kids, a 24-year-old son, and a 22-year-old daughter. We met in college, dated, fell in love, got married, and built what I believed was a wonderful marriage. We did a lot of things together, communicated constantly, and tackled any issues that arose. We both had successful careers that we supported each other in. Our love life was great. Maybe not as frequent as when we were younger, but just as passionate. She's in IT, and I own a small landscaping company that employs 75 people, which I started after graduation. She's been working from home a lot since COVID, and we've been discussing me stepping back from the day-to-day -day operations and her going part-time so we can spend more time together and travel, especially now that the kids are established. Looking back, there were none of the red flags I've read so much about. No strange texting habits, no guarding her phone, no changes in her wardrobe, no unusual behavior, no nights out with colleagues from work. She'd go out, usually with friends or family. The next day, someone would always tell me I should have joined. But I liked her having her own time, and I enjoyed my solitude in my workshop. She was always home early. So, to say I was caught off guard is putting it mildly. D-Day. The previous week, I'd planned a surprise weekend at a friend's romantic B&B for our anniversary. It was the winter festival weekend. I left work early to surprise her, telling her to pack for a trip. As I pulled into the driveway, I spotted an unknown car. Immediately, I had a gut feeling. I didn't know why, but I did. I sat there, hoping I was wrong, but my gut said otherwise. I sat there, contemplating my next move. Should I leave and confront her later, pretend I didn't see anything? I was shaking so much I could barely see. When I face uncomfortable tasks at work, I tell myself to man up and get it over with. Suddenly, my shaking stopped and I felt oddly calm. I had no idea how, because inside I was a wreck. I quietly entered through the back door and my black lab was lying there, looking sad, as if he knew something was off, instead of his usual excited greeting. Gosh, I adore that dog. He stays put as I tiptoe up the stairs. As I reach the top, the sounds from our bedroom become clear. I approach the door, swing it open, and there he is, her boss, on top of my wife. I pause for a moment before shouting, Surprise! The ensuing chaos would be comical if it weren't so heart-wrenching. He rolls off, attempting to escape the bed, but ends up entangled in the sheets. My wife is repeatedly shrieking, Oh my God! while trying to cover herself, but she can't, because he's still tangled up. Eventually, he frees himself and starts searching for his clothes, which are on the other side of the bed. It strikes me that they're in the same spot where mine usually land. For some reason, I beat him to them and snatch them up. My wife is sobbing, repeating, I'm so sorry. I back up to the door and stand there while he's standing next to the bed, naked. I grab the large armchair from the corner, drag it to the door, and sit down. He asks for his clothes, but I refuse and toss him my wife's robe hanging on the door. He starts to approach me. Now even at 51, I'm in good shape. At 6 feet 3 inches, 240 pounds, years of gym workouts and landscaping work have kept me fit. I gaze at him and warn, if you come any closer, it won't end well for either of us. You'll end up in the hospital and I'll land in jail. So, how about you just take a seat? My wife is now weeping into the pillow, and he sits down. After an awkward silence, he asks, what's next? I respond, I honestly don't know. My wife's crying has subsided a bit, and she sits up. Eventually, I pull out my phone and declare, you're both going to spill everything while I record it. They exchange glances, and my wife queries, what do you mean by everything? I retort, exactly that, everything. How it began, how long it's been going on, when, where, hotel stays, dinners, the works, everything. My wife insists this was the only time to which I shout, bull crap, there's no way you'd be comfortable enough to bring him into our bed if this wasn't a long-standing affair. If you lie to me again, I'm walking out that door and seeking a divorce attorney. She breaks down crying again. So for the next 10 to 15 minutes, the truth pours out. It's been happening for over nine months. 
It began with him flirting with her and so on, until he invited her to lunch and she accepted. A few drinks later, they were in a hotel. She came home to me that night as if nothing had happened. She insists that it was tearing her apart and she wanted to confess, but didn't know how. Once more, I cry foul. If it was tearing you apart, you wouldn't have continued it so effortlessly. They even attended a week-long work conference that I used to accompany her to. She informed me that company policy had changed and spouses were no longer allowed. I pocket my phone and the room falls silent again. Then, an idea strikes me. I rummage through his clothes for his phone and request his passcode. Surprisingly, he provides it, so I start browsing through his phone. I discover some photos of a woman I presume is his wife and inquire about her name, Carol. She's quite attractive, though not as stunning as my Ashley. I inform him as I find more pictures of children. Turns out he has three. And finally, a family portrait of all of them. I hold up the phone and remark, a lovely family. Why would you risk it all for a fling with my wife? His response, what do you mean risk it all? Me, you genuinely believe Carol won't find out? Him, how would she find out? Me, I'm about to call her right this moment. He stands up and protests, no, you can't. My wife shrieks, please don't do this to him. I snap, don't do this to him. You've shattered me, our family, our friends, our future, and my heart. And you're concerned about his well-being? I'm trembling again trying to hide my tears, but I can't keep it together any longer. I slump back into the chair and start weeping. She attempts to approach me, but I glare at her and command, keep your distance. After a bit, I regain my composure and glance at his phone again. He pleads once more, please, I'm begging you, I promise I'll tell her. Sure you will, I retort. He stands there, begging me not to, as I locate her number, and decide a FaceTime call would be even more impactful. She picks up, and looking puzzled, asks, Who are you? Is my husband all right? He's fine for now, but that's about to change. I switch the camera to show him standing there in my wife's robe. I state, I believe you're familiar with this man. The room he's in is my bedroom. The floral robe he's sporting belongs to this woman. As I swivel the phone to capture my wife, who's attempting to hide under the sheets. But it's too late. That's my wife, and I arrived home early today to find them in bed together. I genuinely feel sorry for her, and terrible about how I broke the news. She begins to sob, and he tries the honey, I'm so sorry. I can explain. It was just one time spiel. I advise her not to trust a single word, he says. It's been happening for over nine months and I've spent the last 15 minutes recording all the details they were willing to divulge. I assure her I'll text her my contact info, and she should send me her email address so I can forward her the video. I hand him his phone, and overhear her warning him that a packed bag will be waiting outside when he gets home, and if he tries to enter the house, she'll call the cops before she hangs up. I throw his clothes at him, and he exits once he's dressed. Now it's just me and my wife left. She gazes at me and starts shedding tears, apologizing profusely. She never intended to cause me pain. Could I find it in my heart to forgive her? It was meaningless. All the typical cheater's excuses. I stare at her, instruct her to pack her things and get out of my house. I head downstairs and pour myself a drink. I'm sitting on the sofa when she descends the stairs. She begins to approach me and I command, Just stop. She inquires if we can discuss this. And I respond, perhaps, just perhaps, but not now. I inform her it's going to be incredibly difficult to resist seeking a divorce attorney. And she starts weeping again. She looks at me and I can tell an I love you is on the tip of her tongue. I interject, don't you dare utter those words right now, because I don't think I'll ever trust them again. More tears flow as she turns and exits the door, seeing her in tears, walking out the door, my entire world leaving, I crumble and collapse on the floor, shaking, crying uncontrollably. I can't tell how much time passed, but eventually I manage to sit up, still shedding tears, and I dial my best friend. I attempt to speak, but the tears start flowing again, and I can't get the words out. He asks, what's wrong? But I can't respond. He asks if I'm at home and I manage to grunt a, yes, and he assures me he's on his way. Half an hour later, He's in my living room. I'm still in tears. 
I hand him my phone with the video on display, and he starts to watch. I can't stand to hear it, and go to fix us both a drink. He enters the kitchen, takes my drink away, and pours them both down the sink, saying, this isn't going to help you. He insists, I can't stay here alone tonight, and instructs me to go upstairs and pack a bag. I come back downstairs, and he has my lab on a leash, and we head to his place. Update. For those of you who commented on how wonderful my friend is, his name is Dan, and I couldn't agree more. Given our long-standing friendship, it's only natural that our families would be close. Our children are friends. And when they were younger, we used to go on family camping trips together. Over the years, his wife Terry and mine have become close friends, which is relevant to what happened next. As we were driving to his house, I was silent, and Dan was growing increasingly angry. When we arrived at his place, he walked in and asked Terry, Did you know? She responded with a confused, No, what? He raised his voice and asked again, Did you know? I intervened, telling him to calm down and reminding him that this wasn't her fault. He realized he was out of line and apologized to Terry with a hug. Now, utterly bewildered, Terry was handed my phone by Dan, who said, Show her. I took my dog outside, not wanting to hear it again. When it was over, Terry came outside in tears and gave me a long, comforting hug. She took my hand, and we went back inside. The three of us spent the next hour or so talking and crying, crying and talking, all the while my phone was buzzing non-stop. As you might have guessed, it was my wife. I disregard the calls and erase the texts, without even glancing at them. Then, my son rings up. He's curious about what's happening. His mom is at his place with his wife, claiming I kicked her out. I ask him, did she tell you why? He responds, no. I tell him, hand her the phone, she needs to explain. He asks why, and I tell him I'll send him the video if she doesn't, and then I hang up. About ten minutes later my son calls back, sobbing. All he can stutter out is a series of WTF. I switch from being upset to being a comforting dad, reassuring him that it's going to be alright and that none of this is his fault. He calms down and checks if I'm okay, to which I respond with a tearful, of course not. He finally tells me that his mom will be staying the night and quickly ends the call. My phone rings again, this time it's my daughter. I had forgotten that I asked her to look after the dog while we were supposed to be away for the weekend. She's wondering where Cooper, my lab, is. I tell her plans have changed and we're not going, but she can still stay at the house. Neither of us will be home tonight. She asks, What do you mean, neither of you? Where are you? I tell her, I'm at Dan and Terry's, and your mom is at your brother's. She insists, Dad, tell me what's going on. I respond, I can't right now. I'll swing by the house tomorrow and we can talk then. She keeps pushing, but I keep refusing. Eventually, she gives up and ends the call. I know exactly where the next call is going to be. Then, I ping my son giving him a heads up about an imminent call. Next, I dial my wife, asking her if she's ready to spill the beans to our daughter, or if the task falls on me. Her response is nothing but a fresh wave of tears. I disconnect the call. After a half hour, there's a knock at the door. Dan lets my daughter in. Seeing me in tears, she rushes to me, and we both break down in a tight embrace. She's unaware of the reason behind our emotional outburst. When we manage to regain some composure, I call my wife again, letting her know that our daughter is with me, and once again, I ask if she's ready to break the news, or should I put her on speaker. My daughter chimes in, asking her mom to clarify what she's supposed to reveal, but all she hears is more crying. So, I decide to step up, ending the call without revealing any details. I then drop the bombshell. I found out today, that her mother has been having an affair for the past nine months. Just when I thought my pain couldn't intensify, the look of hurt on my little girl's face brings me to my knees. She's shaking, too shocked to even cry. I'm on the floor, a sobbing wreck, immobilized. I feel like I've let her down when she needed me the most. I couldn't even muster the strength to move. Terry, with tears in her eyes, rushes over to comfort her, promising her that things will eventually be okay. Dan is also shedding tears. Like I mentioned, our families are tight-knit. She finally releases this heart-wrenching cry that I know will haunt me forever, even if I live to be a century old. I finally gather myself and go to embrace them both. 
we all eventually find our way to the couch, lost for words. I ask my daughter if she's going to be alright. She looks at me and says, Dad, don't fret about me. Are you going to pull through? I manage to croak out, uh, I'll cope. She asks if she can take Cooper with her to the house, and if her fiancé Tim can come stay there. Naturally, I agree. I'm relieved she won't be alone after she leaves. Terry is livid, saying, I can't believe she did this, and proceeds to call her every name under the sun. She calms down and grabs her phone, saying she's going to call her, looking at me, expecting me to object. I tell her, go ahead, but put it on speaker. So she calls, exchanging small talk and so on. Finally, she tells her that Mike, that's me, called Dan in tears after she left the house, and now I'm staying there. She, Terry, knows everything. Again, more crying. Terry just lets loose, yelling at her. What were you thinking? How could you? Why didn't you come talk to me before you started down this path? If something was lacking, why didn't you talk to Mike? You know how understanding he is. Do you have any idea how many people you've hurt? Darlene, our daughter, just left here. I can't even begin to describe the look on her face when Mike told her. Dan and I will never be able to see you in the same light again. How could you be so damn self-centered? Just more sobbing on the other end, repeating how remorseful she is. Terry doesn't end the call, just listens to her weep. After a moment or so, I ask Terry to hand me the phone. Ashley? No answer. I call her name again. Ashley? She finally responds. Yes, babe. I retort. You've lost the right to call me that. More sobbing from her end. I just want to know, what are you truly sorry for? If I hadn't come home early, would you have realized the gravity of your actions? Or would you have slept with your boss once we returned from our trip? More crying. You're not really sorry for all the people you've hurt, including your boss's family. You're just sorry you got caught. I end the call. Dan, Terry, and I chat a bit more while my phone continues to buzz incessantly. I finally attempt to sleep, but to no avail. In the morning, I ask Dan to drive me home, give Terry a hug, and express how much they both mean to me. I tell Dan I plan to head to my cabin for some solitude. He agrees that it's a wise move. As we're driving, I notice that amidst the flurry of notifications on my phone, there's one message from my wife's boss's wife, expressing her gratitude for the revelation and providing her email address. I forward the video and offer her the chance to reach out if she needs to unload. It might be beneficial for both of us. I pack up quietly, careful not to disturb Darlene and Tim. As I'm loading up the truck, I pick up a couple of my 22 rifles. Dan questions my actions, and I explain, You know, I usually do some target practice up there. Not this time, he counters, confiscating them. Cooper hops in and off we go. Upon arrival, about 2.5 hours later, I get the place opened up and start a fire in the fireplace. Cooper and I take a stroll in the woods. It's somewhat soothing, but not entirely. My son rings to check up on me, and I inform him of my whereabouts. I tell him if his mother wants to stay at the house, that's fine, but she needs to clear out before I return. He agrees. After our walk, Cooper dozes off by the fireplace, and I head out to chop some firewood. It's a great workout, and surprisingly therapeutic. With each axe swing, I alternate between envisioning my wife's face and her boss's. I stay put Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. On Monday I start making calls, first to my office, letting them know I'll be out for a bit, but can be contacted for emergencies. Next, I call my go-to attorney for any company-related legal issues, who recommends a divorce lawyer. Thursday, I've got a meeting with a lawyer I've contacted. Then, I'm on the phone with the bank, putting a hold on our shared accounts. Next up, credit cards, cancelling them all and asking for new ones to be sent out. Being alone in the woods has given me some clarity about my next steps. I find myself trembling again, questioning whether I'm really going to go through with this or try to salvage our marriage. After I get home, I find this subreddit and start reading other people's stories. It helps, but only a little. Midweek, I head into the office and chat with my HR manager. We have a close professional relationship that's about to get more personal. I spill the beans and ask for advice on how to approach their company. She advises me to talk to my lawyer before I do anything. She asks if I'm going to get tested. She recommends someone and also says I should see my doctor for an STD check. I make calls to both and set up appointments for Thursday. 
I meet with my now lawyer, show her the video. This time, I can actually listen. She starts shaking her head and says, why do people do such stupid things? Turns out, she has absolutely no tolerance for cheaters. Her husband cheated on her and dragged her through hell. So much so that she changed her practice and became a divorce attorney. She reassures me that everything will be okay and I sign a contract with her. I ask about telling the wives and the boss's HR and she says we should wait. In the meantime, I've had a meeting with my wife. She's taken refuge at our son's place. At least, she's wise enough to understand that I need some space and wasn't at the house when I returned. I've been crashing on the couch because I can't bear to step foot in our bedroom. When I need to grab stuff, I try to get as much as possible to minimize the number of times I have to enter that room. Thanks for sticking with me this far. It took an eternity to type this out. Writing about my daughter had me in tears for several hours. I'll provide another update next week. Update. Once again, I want to express my deep gratitude for all the advice and support I've received from this community. I'm indebted to each and every one of you in a way I can never repay. All I can do is say thank you and try to respond to all the comments. The support and encouragement have been incredibly helpful. Many of you have commented on the strength I showed during the confrontation. But right now, I feel anything but strong. I'm just going through the motions. All the advice has been excellent and is helping me move forward. Secondly, the reason for this post and my original one was because I was seeking help. Trust me, there was plenty. Given the reason my first post was removed, I was told it was because it had too much storytelling and not enough requests for support. I'll try to keep this brief, but I believe details are important. I'm starting to accept that there's likely no coming back from this, and I'm 99% certain of what my decision will be. Yet, I can't shake the thought that I'll be discarding 29 years of our shared life. Even now, I can't bring myself to type X and still refer to her as my wife. What's wrong with me? Help. On D-Day, she ended up at our son's place with his wife. He called, puzzled about what was going on and why I'd kicked his mom out. I told him she needed to tell him or I would. He knew I'd gone to my best friend's house. My daughter, who was supposed to be dog-sitting, came home to find no dog. Eventually, she showed up at my friend's place, wanting to know what was wrong. I told her. The pain on her face was worse than catching my wife in bed with her boss, and it devastated me. She left with the dog to our house and had her fiancé come over. On Saturday morning, I told my friend I was going to spend a few days at the cabin. Could he drop me home? He agreed it was a good idea. So, I packed up, took the dog, and spent some time at the cabin walking in the woods with the dog and splitting firewood. It was a good workout and therapeutic. I stayed there until Saturday, then drove home. On Monday, I started making phone calls to the bank, credit card companies, and a lawyer I use for company matters. He recommended someone, whom I called and met on Thursday. I played her the recording. She was extremely confident, and I hired her. I asked about informing my wife's boss and HR department, and she suggested we hold off. I'm home now, sleeping on the couch. I can't bring myself to go into the bedroom, except for clothes. On Friday, my son called to tell me his mom couldn't stay there anymore. It was causing strain for him and his wife. Could she come home? I hadn't spoken to my wife since D-Day. I reluctantly agreed. She returned on Saturday. I went back to the cabin. It was freezing, but I managed. On Monday, I went straight to the office. The people there love my dog, and he gets spoiled. I finally went home on Monday night. When I saw my wife, all I could see was the image of her in bed with her boss on D-Day. I don't think I'll ever get past that. Any suggestions? We didn't speak. I changed and went to my basement office to keep busy. Eventually, I watched TV in the basement. She came downstairs and asked if we could talk about this. I told her I wasn't ready yet, and asked her to leave me alone. While she was there... I fell asleep in the recliner, woke up early, went to the gym, showered there, and went to work. My routine is to go home late for the rest of the week. On Friday, my HR manager checks in on me. I fill her in on the recent events and my therapist visit. She suggests that I should stop sleeping on couches and chairs and buy a new bed. I think it's a fantastic idea. I withdraw half of the remaining joint account funds which is my wife's share and head out to buy a new bed. 
The delivery is scheduled for Saturday. I wait at the office for the call that they'll be there in 30 minutes. I stop to pick up a couple of subs for the delivery guys and wait nearby. When they arrive, I meet them, treat them to lunch, and give each of them $25 to do me a favor. I ask them not to haul away the old mattress and if they could come back later to pick it up. I ask them to lean it against a tree near the street. They look puzzled, and I tell them to give me five minutes and come in. They'll understand. Now, I had thought about burning the old mattress in the driveway, but I didn't want to deal with the cleanup. I go upstairs and strip the bedding. While I'm doing this, something comes back to me that I need to find out about. I take a can of Blaze Orange spray paint that we use for marking properties we're working on, and spray wife cheated on me in our bed, in big letters. The guys come in, and my wife asks what's happening. I tell her I can't sleep in that bed anymore, and that she bought me a new one. She seems upset, but retreats downstairs. The new bed is set up, and the guys leave the old mattress where I requested. After a while, she informs me that they left the old mattress in the yard, and that they'll be back for it. I respond, struggling to keep a straight face. I don't think she's caught on yet, but the entire neighborhood certainly has. Come Valentine's Day, she attempts to be romantic and initiates intimacy. I reject her, stating that I wouldn't take her up on the offer, even if she were the last woman on earth. She retorts, saying that we don't just have sex, we make love. Her voice filled with distress. I counter that we haven't made love since she started sleeping with her boss. She looks taken aback. Did she think I'd forget? I'm utterly baffled by her thought process. I decide it's as good a time as any to have a discussion and ask her to sit down in the living room. I ask her what she wants to do. Should we attempt to mend things or should we divorce and move on? I'm not sure why I even proposed the former. I guess I'm hung up on the idea of discarding 29 years. Please convince me otherwise. She claims she's willing to do anything I ask to rectify the situation and pleads for my forgiveness. I tell her she needs to confess to everyone in our family, starting with her parents and my mom, including the details of how I discovered the affair. Our kids aren't aware of this detail yet. They're visiting tonight. I'll provide an update later on how that unfolds. That's my current situation. I'm still in a state of shock from everything and constantly battling the urge to confront her boss, but I still need advice. When will things start to improve, or is this my new reality? Update. That evening my mom, my dad passed away three years ago, her parents, her sister and brother-in-law all come over. We all settle in the living room, and I make sure to sit as far away from her as possible. They start with the comforting words, What's wrong? We love you. Everything will be okay. Assuming someone is seriously ill. I glance at her and say, This story isn't going to tell itself. Her dad looks at me, and I swear his eyes are saying, Oh no as if he senses what's coming. I have to give her credit. She tearfully confesses everything, including the part where I walked in on them in our bed. After a long, uncomfortable silence, she pleads, Somebody say something. I respond, What are they supposed to say? That you're a terrible person? That you've hurt me more than you can imagine? Ripped my heart out? Thrown away 29 years? And ruined our family? Not to mention the damage you two have done to his family. Was the sex really worth all that? I just keep going. All the anger, hatred, and betrayal I've been bottling up comes pouring out. I didn't know I could be so harsh. Her mom finally says, That's enough. She agrees that she deserves it all and runs upstairs crying. Her mom tries to follow her, but her dad says, No, leave her alone. She needs to suffer for a while before this can get any better. We chat for a bit. They offer their support and tell me if I need anything, just ask. I tell them I've been seeing a counselor, and I think I'll be okay, but I appreciate their offer. I tell them that despite everything, I still love her, and that she's going to need them more than I do. I go to bed and sleep better than I have since D-Day. The next morning before I leave, I go into the guest room and can tell she didn't sleep and has been crying all night. I truly believe that for the first time since D-Day, the gravity of what's happening has finally hit her. Telling her family, and having me lash out at her like I did, I think it snapped her out of the affair fog. She looks like she's genuinely remorseful. I tell her we need to talk, more like I talk, she listens. I explain that I'm 99% leaning towards divorce, 
but am still clinging to the 1% life raft. That if there's any hope, she needs to do what I ask to help me get over this. She says she'll do anything, just to please not do anything yet. I remind her of a story I told her when my dad died. When I was 17, my dad shared some wisdom with me. He said, you'll face tough times in life, but how you handle them speaks volumes about your character. Never make crucial decisions when you're upset. At the time, I brushed it off with a casual, yeah, dad, whatever. I start to tear up as I say how much I wish he were here so I could tell him that I was really listening. She gets up and hugs me. I don't reciprocate, but it feels comforting, which unnerves me. She sits back down and I tell her she needs to move out. I can't heal if I see her every day. We need to go no contact. She agrees and asks what else she can do. I tell her I'm too emotional to think straight now, but I'll let her know. On my way to work, I call my lawyer and arrange to meet her today. She's free, so we meet for coffee. I update her on everything, the 99-1% dilemma, etc. I ask her to prepare divorce papers in case I decide to proceed. She suggests that if I can afford it, I should find an apartment for my wife and pay the first month's rent. This would demonstrate good faith if things go to court. I agree, and she says she'll have something for me to review by Monday. I call a real estate broker we've worked with over the years, explain the situation, and what I need. He refers me to a rental agent. The agent finds a suitable place, and I meet with the property manager to pay for the rest of February, March, and the deposit. When I get home, I tell my wife about the apartment, what I've paid for, and that she needs to meet the manager and sign the lease. It's a six-month lease, which seems like a plus. She's surprised by how quickly I've acted. I tell her that I needed her not to come home from our sons. While she's gone, I arrange for movers to come on Saturday. When she gets home, I tell her about the movers and ask why she hasn't asked about finances. I inform her that I've canceled the credit cards, withdrawn my half from our joint account, and canceled the debit card. She seems angry but admits she doesn't blame me. It turns out she hasn't needed to spend anything, as she's been splitting her time between our son's place and home. She also reveals that she requested a leave of absence from work due to personal issues. They allowed her to take her paid vacation first. On Friday, I tell her she can take whatever she needs for the new place. Just leave me some essentials and nothing from the basement or any family heirlooms and my new bed. I also tell her that I'm open to marriage counseling. She should find three different counselors and I'll choose the one I think is best. I leave early on Saturday morning and return to a half-empty house, including the TV. That's okay, I wanted a bigger one anyway. My friend still has my liquor, so I stop by to pick up my favorite bourbon and enjoy a glass while typing this. Sorry this was so long, thanks for reading this far. Tomorrow, I'm hitting the gym, making my favorite chili, and buying a new TV. I'm sure I'll have more to post in the future. Music